Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, this morning we are going to end this series of messages on building the Christian. Uh, We have been looking for the last 15 messages at how to build the child of God, uh, to grow, to spiritually mature the way that God wants us to. Just to kind of revisit where we have been over those 15 messages after today's, uh, we took a look first of all that we have to be abiding in Christ. Uh, That has got to be where it all begins for you and I as believers, abiding in Him. We have to stay gospel-centered. We have to indulge our spiritual appetites. So we indulge our spiritual appetites through, number one, the Word of God, uh, but also through a number of other ways that we can build ourselves up. We have to view prayer as as necessary as breathing. We saw that we have to grow, and that growth is intentional and it's directional. We have to grow in in knowledge. We have to grow in grace. We have to grow in wisdom. We took a look at how we need to walk by faith and not by sight, but it's a, a lifestyle. It's a pattern that we do this. We are supposed to have a growing love for the body of Christ, our church family. And it's not just about loving each other. It's also about you got to like one another. Say, oh, I don't. I have to put up with them. No, don't say that because the Bible says our love as well as our like for our brothers and sisters has got to be growing. We are supposed to also have a growing love for the sinners of this world. We are to have a right attitude on giving and serving. And then the final message a couple of weeks ago that we looked at was about worship. And that worship, just like Brother Ryan said this morning, our worship, it is supposed to be directional. And it's not this direction. And it's not this direction. It is always this direction. Today we came to offer worship to something or someone. We didn't just show up. We are worshiping something or someone. And did our worship go to the one that deserves it? Or did it try to bless somebody else? Did it try to bless ourselves? Worship is about God. It's about what we bring to Him. And so we talked about that. This final one that we see this morning, it is so simple, it is so elementary, and yet it is one that we tend to stumble over. We have got to be ruthless with sin. If we want to grow in the Lord like we are supposed to grow in the Lord, we have got to be ruthless with sin. If we are not growing spiritually, there must be some kind of sin in our lives. Otherwise, we would be growing. Say, oh, no, I just I don't know why I'm not growing, but I'm just not growing. But it, there's no sin. Well, wait a second. If we are healthy, we're going to grow. If we're not healthy, we're not going to grow. Wednesday was Brian's first day of school. I had not seen my kids, for most of those kids, for 84 days. Do you suppose that I saw growth in them in just 84 days? Did I see some changes? Did I see some kids get on the bus and they were taller? Did I see some kids get on the bus and their faces had begin, begun to lose the baby face and are starting to mature? And it's like, wow. You just kind of want to look at them and say, wow, you, you were busy over the summer, weren't you? Look at how you've grown. You don't want to say that because that embarrasses them. But if you saw a third grader get on the bus and they look the same as they did when they were in preschool, would you not think there's a problem? That something's not right? Something is definitely wrong? Well, then how is it that as believers in Christ, we can't see the same thing? That if we are not growing, something's wrong. And we've got to trace that back to sin. You have to point your finger at the person facing you in the mirror. No, we say, oh no, it's the church's fault. It's the people's fault around me. No. You can spiritually grow and mature and thrive in spite of those things. So don't blame those things. You say, oh, I don't believe that. Let's talk about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was somebody who, as he was sitting as a prisoner in a jail cell, he grew spiritually, didn't he? Let's talk about Corey Ten Boom, who was in an internment camp, a Jewish internment camp. And during that time, she grew spiritually. 
Let's talk about a lady by the name of Johnny Erickson Tata who is trapped inside of a paraplegic body. And this is a lady who has grown and is continuing to grow spiritually. I just heard something from her this past week, and I was like, oh, that was good. She was talking about her own personal prayer life, and she knew that as she was coming into prayer on this particular morning, the lady that works with her and helps her get up in the morning and get dressed and do all those kinds of things, they have devotions and prayer time together, and she was talking about how grumbly she was in her prayer time, and she just stopped. And she said, excuse me a moment. And her and the Lord had a heart-to-heart right there where she said, my heart's not right. And got things right so that she can continue in her time with the Lord. In spite of being trapped in those things, in spite of their environments, they were growing. And if we're not growing, we got to look at ourselves. Now, this is where the problem comes in. Let's, in Ephesians chapter 5, the first five verses, Paul says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The first thing that we need to do this morning is look at the problem with understanding our sin. The problem with understanding our sin. It's easy to look at a list like this, And many other places in Scripture, and as as Christians, I am guessing, 99.9% of us, and I'm hoping for the 100%, we look at this list of things that are mentioned here, and we go, oh, I don't do those things. Praise God, hallelujah, pat me on the back. Therefore, we walk away with an overinflated opinion of ourselves, and we think that since we don't have any sin in our life, it's not our fault that we're not growing Let's point the finger at everything else. But Paul saw something in himself that should cause us to look deeply into our hearts. Go back with me to Romans chapter 7. What Paul is writing here should wipe away any self-confidence that we have that we are so pristine and spotless. In Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14, and It's really interesting, as you read this out, Paul just, he pours his heart out. And he says, starting in verse 14, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin." Theologically, we put a couple of words to this that Paul is describing in his life. He is describing sins of commission, things that he is actively committing that he should not. But Paul is also acknowledging sins of omission, things that he should be doing that he isn't. Now, I don't know about you, but Romans chapter 7 kind of jerks a knot in my thinking. When you think about the Apostle Paul, I mean, of all the New Testament characters, Jesus obviously number one, but then don't you kind of think of Paul being number two? 
I mean, we're talking the apostle Paul. Yeah, we know Saul of Tarsus, but when he got saved, man, this was a guy that was just on fire, lit up for God. This is a guy that started churches. This is a guy that wrote these letters under the inspiration of God. This is a guy that visited these churches. He did all these missionary journeys. This is a guy that was was beaten and abused and all these kinds of things for his testimony. This is Paul. Do you ever look at that, a passage like Romans 7, and scratch your head and say, what in the world did he possibly do wrong? Don't we get kind of the impression that Paul was just about nigh unto perfect? And I honestly, I know it's none of our business, it's none of my business, but I really want to know, Paul, what was you doing that you shouldn't have been doing? I can tell you a couple of things about him that he was doing that he shouldn't have been doing. Paul was a short-fused individual, and he was intolerant of anybody that didn't line up and didn't want to get their act together, and if they messed up along the way, Paul was intolerant of them. You say, where do you see that in the Bible? Oh, just take a look sometime at Acts chapter 15, and read about the story when Paul was going to, with Barnabas, they wanted to take John Mark. Well, take that back. Barney wanted to take John Mark. Paul says, absolutely not. Because the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what John Mark had done, but at some previous time, John Mark had left them, had not stuck with them, and Paul held it against him. And Barnabas, oh, no, let's bring him. This would be good for him. This might be a good way to to reintroduce him into the work. Paul says, no. And the Bible says that the contention between the two of them was so sharp that they split paths. We've got our own little church split here. As these two split ways, that was Paul. Yep, that was Paul. Paul was lit up over this. So we can see some of the things that Paul did, but then you say, well, what about those sins of omission? There were things that Paul says I should be doing, but I'm not doing. And I I look at Paul's life and I say, what more could you have possibly done? But Paul knew the truth. He knew his heart. Now, if Paul could come to this kind of a conclusion about himself, Why can you and I not take an honest look at ourselves and say, hey, I have got sins of commission. I have got sins of omission. I'm doing things I shouldn't do, and I know it. And I am doing, and I'm not doing things I should do, and I know it. Therefore, the problem is not this way. The problem is this way. Why can't we come to the same conclusion and realization that Paul came to? I would suggest that we have to. Here's the second thing, the solution with understanding our sin. The solution with understanding our sin. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Sing that scripture with me, you know it. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior. I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Folks, that has got to be more than a great passage of Scripture or a great chorus to sing. That has got to be the desperate cry from our hearts. Search me, O God, know my heart. If we are struggling with spiritual growth, we got to get to the heart of the issue. How much more, 
how much more do we need to be making this our prayer daily and throughout the day? Lord, search my heart. Why is this so important? Go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Now, the different things that we have seen about spiritual growth. All of those things that we have seen about spiritual growth are things that are measurable. And that was the purpose of this whole study, is that when there is growth, growth is measurable in some way, shape, or form. You can tell. But in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything that we say, everything that we do, every place we allow our feet to take us, everything that we allow our hands to do, that we allow our ears to listen to, that we let our eyes look at, everything we do is governed by the condition of our heart. So the solution to it all is we've got to get our hearts right. And to get our hearts right, going back to Paul, we have to say, oh, wretched man that I am. We have to acknowledge before God, I am doing things I shouldn't, and I'm not doing things that I should be doing. We've got to come to that conclusion. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, Jesus said, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In Matthew 15, Jesus said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart... Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. The heart affects everything. And if the heart isn't right, nothing else is going to be right. You can go through the right motions, but you know deep down that's all it is is motions. So whose fault is it if our motions aren't right? It's ours. Because it's not out of my heart that comes your actions. And it's not out of your heart that comes your spouse's actions. It's not out of your children's heart that comes your actions. It is out of my heart that comes my actions. So me. So I have to deal with my heart. Don't you think we should examine our hearts pretty thoroughly if we really want to get things under God's control? Here's the third thing. The last point, and you're looking at your watch going, really? Last point, main point. The last one is this, the plan to deal with our sin. We have to make a plan to deal with our sin. We've covered the first and most important thing, our hearts. We have got to get our hearts right. But now, what do we do while we're getting our hearts right? Do we just let the actions just float to the wayside and leave them alone, don't even think anything about them? Or do we go ahead and do the right things that we're supposed to be doing? Let's take a look at this. First question we need to ask ourselves is this, what are we neglecting? Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 17, what are we neglecting? What is it that we should be doing that we aren't doing? we got to figure that out. we got to nail that down. James chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is what? Do you believe that? If you know you should be doing something, God has said to do these things, and you're not doing it. The Bible says it's sin. How many of you are familiar with a couple of guys by the name of Penn Gillette Raymond Teller? Anybody recognize those names? A couple of you do. Their act, they go by Penn and Teller. They are a comedy uh, magic act that they have taken worldwide. And uh, I'm not endorsing it by any stretch of the imagination, but just telling you that's what they do. Teller is typically the silent of the duo, and that's what makes the act the funniest, 
is because he just plays the, the straight, doesn't talk, doesn't do anything kind of guy except for the portion of the act that he's supposed to do. Penn is an avowed atheist. He has absolutely no qualms whatsoever about promoting atheism and denouncing all things God, Christian, Christianity, church, Bible, has no problems whatsoever denouncing this. A few years back, though, after a show, a man walked up to him and genuinely complimented the act and said, you know, it was really good and enjoyed it and all that kind of stuff. Penn said this about, Penn's the atheist, he said this, he says, and he was truly complimentary. He didn't seem like empty flattery was being given. He was really kind and nice and sane. And he looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. Penn went on to say that he doesn't respect people who don't proselytize. He says, I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize them, he says. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you, and you didn't believe it, and the truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. An atheist said that. That's not a Christian. An atheist knows what the Christian ought to be doing. They ought to be evangelizing the lost if they really believe what they say they believe. Those are the things that we don't do that we should be doing. We could create our own list, a biblical list. We know that we should be evangelizing. Christians, you know you should be reading and studying your Bible for yourself, not relying on the church services to spiritually uh, give you nutrition, but that you need to be taking nourishment throughout the week and not just a little quick read a little passage of scripture close it and i'm done and i did my thing for the day but it should be something that is ongoing throughout the day as believers in christ we know that we need to be prayer pray prayer warriors that we ought to be praying about all things we know that we don't need a sermon telling us that we know that we know that we should be faithful in church not to to neglect the assembling of ourselves together to Hebrews says, and the more and the more as you see the day approaching, we're in a Baptist church. I'll guarantee you, if I was to ask the question, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ could be back at any second? Hey, man, uh. No, we don't. No, we don't. If we did, we couldn't hardly stand to be apart from each other. We would want to be together more and more, according to Hebrews chapter 10. We know that we ought to fellowship. We know that we need to fellowship with other believers. We know that we are to give of our time, our talents, and our tithes. We know that we should be separating from worldly things. We know that we should be living clean and holy lives. I have not said anything here that anybody has said, oh, I didn't know that. We all knew that, and yet how many of us neglect the very things doing the very things that we should be doing? Maybe you look at that list, and you hear that list, and you go, oh, well, I can check my list off. I'm doing really good on all these things. Let me give you two more that you might not have thought of. And to be honest with you, as I was reviewing my notes this morning, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and says, uh, you're missing a couple. Probably because he's saying you're missing a couple. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, so I know that I am supposed to be rejoicing always, but if I'm not, it is a sin of omission. It's still a sin, right? Here's another one. In all things, give 
for this is the will of God, the Scripture says. So if I'm not giving thanks for all things, am I sinning? Yes. It is a sin of omission. I didn't commit a sin. I omitted doing something I'm supposed to do. Therefore, I've got sin in my life. Therefore, I'm not going to be growing. Whose fault is it? Mine. I got nobody to blame but me. How many of these things do we neglect? We have got to be ruthless with sin. And we have got to see the things that we're not doing that we should be doing. And we've got to say, Lord, I am making a covenant between you and me today. I need to get started doing these things, doing these things faithfully, doing these things biblically, doing these things regularly like I ought to be doing. You say, but my heart's just not in it. Well, that's a problem. That is a problem. You say, well, I'm not going to do it until my heart gets in it. So now you're going to compound your sin. How about just be honest with God and say, God, I am going to do what's right. And I'm asking you to get me right. Get my heart right. But I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I tell you what, you will find out how God will get your heart right in the midst of doing what is right. I've shared this for a lot of years. But when Pastor Bennett, many, many years ago, asked me to play the organ at church, I said yes for one reason, and one reason only. You want to guess what it was? Bragging rights, okay. Pride. You're right. It was pride. Did I want to? No. Did I want to do all that extra practicing? No. Did I want to sit up there during the service? No. Was I enjoying doing it? No. Pride wouldn't let me step down. I had to say yes, because I was a proud little stinker. But I tell you what, I kept doing what I'd been asked to do. And I can't tell you what the day was on the calendar or anything like that, but I can tell you one time, we were playing through a congregational song, and my mind was any place but. And I, it's one of those things, the musicians know this, you know this, have you ever driven your car, and you kind of zoned out thinking, and you end up at another place, and it's like, how did I get here? And all that gap in between is missing? Isn't that freaky? You're wondering, did I run over anything? Did I hit somebody? Did I, you know, there's a sickening feeling inside. And I was having one of those moments one day playing the organ. And the Lord spoke in my heart and says, you enjoy serving me, don't you? And I almost jumped and I'm like, where am I at in the song? Am I even where we're supposed to be? I was, that messed me up. And from that moment on, I was able to do it for the right reasons. The Lord had worked on my heart when I didn't even know he was working on my heart. And I didn't even know my heart needed worked on because I was proud. But the Lord humbled me in that experience. That was the weirdest thing. I wish I could say that all the times in my life that he has humbled me gently, and he hasn't, there has been times where he has hit me awful hard. And you know why? Because that was the only thing that was going to get through my thick head. Do what you're supposed to do, and God will take care of getting your heart right. It's amazing how he does that. But here's the second thing. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, the scripture says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Cut off the things that are wrong. First point, start doing the things that we're neglecting. 
Find out what it is we're neglecting that we should be doing and do them. And this one here, cut off the things that are wrong. The word mortify means to make dead. We are supposed to do this. We have to take this action. Matthew chapter 5 tells us, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Uh, Verse 30 says, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. Is the Bible encouraging us to self-mutilation? No. It is telling us to be ruthless with sin. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And if we are serious about taking care of sin in our life, the things that we are doing that we shouldn't be doing, cut off that sin. Cut it off from you. Make no provision for the flesh. Cut it out of your life. In Acts chapter 19, the Bible tells us about some individuals that had accepted the Lord as Savior. These are individuals that were involved in witchcraft and sorcery and all kinds of things like that. But it says in Acts 19, verses 19 and 20, Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. These individuals cut out of their life the things that they had been doing that were sinful, and they burned them at a cost. At a cost. $50,000, or 50,000 pieces of silver. Say, what is that equal in today's money? One commentator says that it estimates between uh, approximately 50,000 days wages. So let's do some math here. Let's say that you work a $20 per hour job, that's 160 days, or $8 million before taxes. That's a lot of money, wouldn't you say? Another commentator estimates this to be between $1 to $5 million in today's money. That commentator must have went ahead and took the taxes out. The point is that there is no cost too great to pay to get rid of sin in your life because the cost to keep sin in your life is even greater. It's even greater. Here's the last thing today. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is still under the last point. 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you're going to deal with sin, we're asking the Lord to get the heart right. We're going to start doing the things that we haven't been doing, that we have neglected, that we should be doing. We're going to stop doing the things that we shouldn't be doing. The third thing is, don't be afraid to run from sin. Don't be afraid to run from it. 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6, starting in verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness... He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content." Then it goes on to say, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in the destruction of perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, we list off all of those things for this reason, verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things, run from them. Don't stand there and think, oh, i got to be tough. i got to be this manly, manly Christian fighting it. God says, get out of there. Just get out of there. Run for the hills. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And Paul tells Timothy, flee also youthful lusts. Running from sin is cowardice. It's just smart. We don't have to stand there and try to fight it. Just get away from it. Remember Joseph, when Potiphar's wife started coming on to him, what did he do? He ran. He got out of that place. This morning, Christians, maybe some of us need to get to running. 
We need to book it. We can see the things that we have been doing that we shouldn't be doing. And we're thinking, oh, I'm going to fight this one more day. I'm going to just keep fighting. I'm going to keep fighting. How about running? Just get away from it. Get out of the situation. Get out of the place where the temptation is at. Get away from it. Run. If we really want to get things under control in our life and deal with sin, we've got to be ruthless. There's no time to namby-pamby around. It's time to get just as ruthless as we possibly can. I ask you this morning as a child of God, what sin or sins is keeping you from growing in the Lord? What is it that you're not doing that you should be doing? What is it that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing? Find those things and do something about it today, Christian. What will we do about it? Will we cast it before the Lord Maybe take some time this morning and spend a moment at the altar and say, Dear God, today I become ruthless where sin is concerned. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Oh, and you see things in your life, you go, man, this, this stuff's not right. I know it's not right. I know I shouldn't be doing this. And so you try to fix it. You came to church this morning hoping to fix it. If I just attend enough church services, it'll get fixed. If I do this, it'll get fixed. No, you're trying to fix the sin problem yourself. You can't do that. It's impossible. I always love the illustration about squeezing jello. You ever remember and kids have started back to school and maybe one of the desserts is going to be that wiggly square jello? I, we used to play with it. It was the oddest looking stuff. I'm not even sure that it was edible. You could poke it, and it'd you know, it'd just go all over the place. You could do things with that square. You could throw them. And they stuck. I mean, it was better than the stuff you can buy in a store, man. That's, that stuff held its shape. Um, you could chew it. like It was like chewing a rubber eraser. Uh, nasty stuff. Take one of those squares and put that in your hand and squeeze it. And what's going to happen? It's just going to come out the cracks, and it's going to find a way of escape. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, you say, I've got to do something about the sin in my life. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. So you put the squeeze on that sin. It's just going to find a different way to come out. That's all it's going to do. You need Jesus. Because Jesus died for those sins. He died because you're a sinner. He was buried in that tomb. He, he shed his blood on the cross to pay the price for your sins. He was buried in the tomb. He arose again from the grave to give you a brand new life. And part of that brand new life is that the chains of sin are broken. So that now you can resist sin. It's not a matter of squeezing it and it squirts out to different things. It's a matter of saying, no, I don't have to do that stuff anymore. Because the power of sin is broken. But lost person without Christ is your Savior. That's not going to happen. But worse than that, because in your mind you're thinking, my sin, okay, so today is going to be a little bit better or worse than yesterday. But there is coming a day of death where you exit this world. And without Jesus as your Savior, instantly in hell forever. Oh, I'll get things right then. Uh, no, the time of opportunity is gone. This is now time of judgment. And you will spend an eternity in hell without Jesus. The sin, oh, <laughs> that's nothing compared to the price of sin. The wages of sin is death. Not just physical, but a spiritual death. And an eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus wants to give you that gift, lost person, today. Will you receive it? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, you know each and every one of our hearts. Nothing is hidden from you. Nothing can be. And as believers, we're just asking this morning that you might do a mighty work in us and through us for your glory. 
But for that lost individual this morning, today needs to be the day of salvation. This needs to be the day where they call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. And I pray that some lost soul is under conviction this morning and that they would recognize the need for Jesus. Have your way in this invitation, we pray it.